Kelly again. We're hanging out, having some wine and chatting about science. Because <laughs> that's how we do it, you know? Um, Indeed. So, Indeed. in preparation for this segment, Kelly asked me to read, or sorry, look into uh, the Wikipedia article on, uh, on quantum mechanics and look at a couple YouTube videos. So, I looked at a couple YouTube videos, I read a couple things. The only thing that I really got from it, which bent my mind into mm -hmm. an obtuse angle at least, maybe not an acute <laughs> angle, but an obtuse angle at least, you know? It bent it a bit, for sure. Because I was like, all I really got from it was that there's, okay, particles can move in either a, like, light particle specifically, mm -hmm. yeah. can move either as a particle or as a wave. So particle theory explains some of it, wave theory explains some of it. Yeah. And if you're watching it, so normally it travels as a wave, but if mm -hmm. you're watching it, it travels as, a, you know, a yeah. particle, which doesn't make any sense at all, yeah. because how the hell does it know we're watching it? That completely blows my mind, completely. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like, what? And there's all these theories based on it knows we're watching it, which yeah. is really weird. Um, additionally, uh, there was a lot of things where everything exists at the same time. It's mm -hmm. the whole Schrodinger's cat thing. Yeah. It's dead and alive at the same, at same time, time. Yeah, which yeah. also blows my mind. Um, quantum entanglement totally blew my mind. So I don't really understand. Okay. So I'm hoping you can explain a little bit more to me. <laughs> okay, where do I start? So. The, the way I approached this subject, like quantum entangle or sorry, quantum mechanics is through quantum computing because it's it's something that's very researched and there's a lot of money going into it. So there's a lot more things that are a bit more defined. Yeah. And in I didn't look into that. Yeah. In, in quantum <laughs> computing there's currently there's quite a few companies that are working on quantum computers, but basically let's back up a little. The term quanta, or quantum, means the tiniest quantity of something. Right. So, all of the quantum computers, they work off of individual particles. Say that again? They use individual particles, like be it photons, electrons, or the nucleus of an atom, to do their computing. Okay. These can all be quantum, or qubits as it's known, and that's okay. a quantum bit. So I have this, this screenshot here of the Wikipedia page, and these are all the different types of um, qubits. Okay, and, and that's the equivalent of a bit. Little... Yeah, these little particles. Okay. And the thing is, so it's a photon, electron, there's a nucleus, and then there's stuff like a Joseph, Josephson junction, which uses electrons as well. Okay. And so, but all of those things, the thing they have in common, they have a round kind of state of being. So let's think of it in dimensions. So the a normal computer works kind of in two dimensions. It's either on or off. Okay. And you can only go along those two dimensions like in that computer. It can be on or off. And that's okay. so your computing has to so be done. So it's a zero or a one. Yeah yeah. Right. And in trying to answer a question in a computer, um you ask really, really simplified questions over and over and over because you're only allowed to say yes or no to every answer. Oh. So the computer has to go through many, many, many different like states of is it yes or is it no? Right. Kind of okay. like that. Okay. And a lot of problems are really difficult to solve in that way because so it would be there's an infinite web. amount. There's kind of like a huge web and it keeps it's kind of exponential growth mm -hmm. in, in the computation. And that's where... Um, quantum computers fall short, or sorry, um, binary computers fall short, like the okay. classical ones, okay. is because they only work along one domain. So if you scale this up and add kind of a, a vector grid to it, you, I'll, I'll delete all of this, <laughs> give me a second. Um, so let's say you have this grid here. So this is zero, zero. Okay. So with a quantum computer, it, because it's, it's, it's working in a round state of being. I'll, I'll get to that later, explaining that. You can have something that's a bit of one in this direction and a bit of one in that direction. And the calculation it does, so you put in, you put in this value as plus 0.9, okay. and this value in as plus 
1.5. Okay. And the vector that comes out, that is the answer that it gives you. Is, is the position of this, or the direction of this line. Okay, so it's more of a two-dimensional so, so, Yeah, thing? so you have, you have a two-dimensional kind of plane of computing. Okay. That's how you think of it in terms of it scaling up. So okay. let's, let's go back a little bit. So the way you Are your brains at an obtuse angle yet? <laughs> so That's what I want to know. <laughs> in, in quantum computing, what you measure... So let's say this is the, the, the electron. Okay. And it's going somewhat around a nucleus. Like okay. It's kind of a weird orbit in one side. But that's not what we're measuring. We're measuring the individual spin of the electron here. Okay. Like it's spinning while it's going around. Okay. So it's kind of like measuring the, act, the angle of the Earth against the Sun. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're not measuring the orbit itself, you're measuring the angle of the spin that it right. is in on the orbit. Okay. Okay. Because the electron is spinning so fast, kind of like, like a gyroscope, so I'll spin this up here, it's really stable because of the angular momentum it has. What's angular momentum? So that's when something is going around really fast, like mm -hmm. rotating, mm -hmm. and because it's... Okay, because it has momentum that keeps in, it Yeah, off in right. every direction, because it's rotational. Mm -hmm. So it kind of like self-stabilizes. Okay. And an electron, it spins at the speed of light, because an electron is the source of light, like the photons in the electron. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, photons in the electron. Yeah. What does so, that mean? So it's kind of like a packet of energy. In order to go to a lower state, it has to limit or release a packet of energy. And right. that's the photon. Okay, okay. And so in a quantum computer, they only measure in two directions, even though it's a three-dimensional object. So this would be the, the north and the south of the spinning electron. Okay. Because the electron spins at the speed of light. In, in a quantum computer, what happens is that they send electromagnetic waves through microwaves at specific times so that it affects the angle of spin. Right, because yeah. so the waves can, will knock against each yeah. other and move. Because those waves are made of photons or electrons sometimes. In quantum computers what they have, they have two antennas, like microwave antennas. Okay. They have one on this side and one on this side. Okay. And that microwave antenna sends electromagnetic pulse in that direction and this sends it in this direction. Okay, so and you're going to move it this way. Yeah, this way or this way. So let's say this is spinning. Okay. The, the direction of the spin here is what is the calculation. So what they okay. do is they send, so let's say we hit this, this like with pulses of microwaves. Okay. And then we hit it from this direction with pulses of microwaves to put it and back. And it'll go back. And, yeah. that, and that combined kind of hitting back and forth and its final, um, its final angle here okay. is what is the sum of the calculation. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's kind of adding up hits. Right. So of, there's like of, 50 hits on that side and 20 hits on this correct. side, and the end result is 30. Yes, correct. Okay. So it's actually it's between 0 and 1. And that's why um, they always say um, in a quantum mechanics kind of realm, it can be either a 0 or a 1. What they're actually saying is it can be, between, it can be somewhere between. It can be 0 0.5. So let me explain it a different way. And, and why quantum computers are important. So in the traditional bits, like I said, every time you add, let's say, one bit, or you double the bits, you double the speed. Okay. So this is one, two, three, four. So let's say you have a four-bit computer. Okay. Then, you, then it has a speed of four. Or let's, let's consider this rod a mass here. This, so this has a mass of four, and it has four... Um, four bits of information. Okay. But on a quantum computer, because you're working in two dimensions, every time you add a column, so this is one, two, three, four, you square the total of possible outcomes. So with one, it's one. Oh. The mass is one. With two, it's four. With three, right. it's nine. And with four, it's... So there's more possible outcomes yeah. per action? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm kind of getting this now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So there's a lot more possible action. And actually, if 
if we were able to manipulate mag or, um, electrons well enough, or understood them at their tiniest level, we would actually get a cube of possibilities. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't just square, it cubes the, the result. So let's make this cube here. So one cube, uh, a one, it's actually a Q-trit. Q-trit. Yeah, okay. that's a, that's a, a cubic cubit. One Q-trit oh. has, let's say, a mass of one, but a, a, a two Q-trit computer would have an equivalent mass of eight. So the amount of complexity that can go into every, every um, computation okay. is kind of its um, number to the power of three, where it's here it's number to the power of two. Okay. So this and computer can scale a lot faster. It, like if you add, if you add one electron to that computer system, the co quantum computer system, okay. it has three axes of input. Like in real life, because it's oh, okay. a three-dimensional object. Yes, yeah. And because it has a three dimen three axes of input, you can have information equivalently coming in in this direction information coming in in this direction and information coming in in this direction. So is this what they're going for with quantum? Oh, sorry, so is the, this what they're going for not yet. with quantum? Eventually, but, but all right of, now they're all on of, this? Yeah, or? Okay. All, of, all of the stuff that's happening is on this right now. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, good to know. Yeah. yeah, because of the way we understand and manipulate electrons, we can only study them from two axes at a time. So one of the, one of the most important concepts of in, in quantum computing is entanglement. And entanglement, like they often describe it as spooky, at a, spooky action at a distance or, or particles that seem to, to like talk to each other faster than the speed of light. Yeah, from like, yeah, this is another thing I learned. It was like, they're from really, really far distances away. Like, you know, yeah. galaxies apart, these two electrons are like, hey, we're pen pals. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever, you know. <laughs> and, and the thing is, if that theory is true, then Einstein's theory of general relativity doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't judge. Like, those yeah. two are, they're, they're really opposed in the field of physics. Yeah, yeah. So like quantum physics and um, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which suggests that everything moves at maximum at the speed of light. So let me try and explain it with um, magnets here. So what you generally have is with quantum entanglement, it's the atoms are not really communicating. What it's saying is that when you place two electrons next to each other, the electrons oppose each other because they're both negative. Right, yeah. they don't so, want to be. Yeah, if you bring them close together, they will kind of repel each other. Oh, totally, and yeah, they'll have to get... that weird force field effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so let's draw a basic atom, and I'll, I'll draw it in the wrong way. So let's say you have an electron here, and you have another nucleus here, and the electron on the orbit here. What this electron might actually want to do is be as far away from the other one as possible. Right. So let's draw both of those electrons separately. So this one might want to be here and this one here right. in terms of its spin. Right, it'll so avoid yeah, being Yeah, it'll try to be as opposite other. as possible. <laughs> right. So when you, when you bring them close together or you apply the same microwaves to them so that they're, they're in opposite states, right. what you get is basically two like, rotating gyroscopes that are synced up in opposite directions. And because they're spinning at the speed of light, they have a lot of angular momentum. It takes energy to change their direction. So if you take this, and you and I spin this, so these are spinning in opposite direction. We won't really. So let's say you put, bring them close together, and then let's say this electron here is opposed to this one. So now they're sitting like this. Okay. And then when you take them apart, they, they because they're spinning, they maintain this direction. So you hold oh, it. Oh, okay. So they hold this direction. And that's quantum entanglement. Is that they started out at the same spin, and when you have them apart, they still have the same spin. But how did they start out? I mean, like, what I heard, you know, yeah. silly probably, but what I heard was that <laughs> they're like, 
entangled from across galaxies yeah. and shit. So how, like, when so did they meet up with each that's other? A, that's a hypothetical. So the way they would do that is they would take two photons and entangle them. So release them at the same p from the same place at the same time so that they're opposite of each other, and they would send them in opposite directions. Okay, if and you want to test it that yeah, way. Yeah, and hypothetically, if you test them both at the same time, you should get the opposite output, the exact opposite, because they're still, this electron is here, this one is up here, so they're still opposite, or this spin. What I don't understand is how, like, Theoretically, I know that they have all these theories like, oh, it's across an entire galaxy and this one electron mm -hmm. is communicating with this other electron because yeah. they were once entangled. Like, purely theoretical. How the it's hell do you know that? It's a purely theoretical. Oh, this is what drives me crazy about yeah. physics. It's like not... Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and oh, in this tiny little situation it yeah. works, but then... There's, Sorry. The thing is, as soon as you measure it, so let's say you measure this one separate from this one, uh -huh. you imply a little bit of angular momentum because you have to check it with photons or with electrons right. or See, with yeah, a magnetic field or something. Them. And that's why oh. they always say as soon as you measure it you destroy the entanglement. Oh. Because, because you have to yeah. remove it yeah. to actually like check it, yeah. to actually measure also, it. Also, anytime you put in microwaves like through a, a quantum computer, okay. you move it. So it's... it's that's so weird. <laughs> It's, it's really useful in, co in computers, though, because what you can then do is you can have these two entangled. You can have them be separate states then, and then you input waves here to change its direction to, add, to make a, a, a computation. Uh -huh. And then you can measure this unaffected one and this affected one and see the difference. And that difference is actually really useful. So what do you mean difference? The difference in, in direction of spin. But if they're entangled, aren't they supposed to like move together no. magically from across no. the universe? No, it, <sighs> it could be. Okay. However, that's that's hypothetical as well. Right. What entanglement it's it's the reason why all this is so confusing is because entanglement assumes that they're still tethered. Yeah. And they're not. They're not still tethered. What it just says is that if you move two electrons apart, or two photons, or two qubits, because they're rotating at the speed of light, you have to input energy to change their direction. Right, 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 right. And if you don't input energy, they should stay the same hypothetically. Right, but then you yeah. change one of them, so you're assuming that everything started from an equal yes. point. Yes, yes. So that's the thing you're mm -hmm. theoretically able to start from, is this zeroing point. Yes, okay. and that zeroing point gotcha. is quite useful because Let's say you spin it up and you measure it. The action of measurement destroys its position. So having right. just one is kind of useless because right. you don't know what to compare it to because you can't look at it without affecting it. Because you have to send photons to look at it or a magnetic field of some kind. But if you have to send photons to look at them, then mm -hmm. wouldn't... So say you have two. Yeah. You have two and they're both spinning in this this direction yeah right and you put a bunch of microwaves or whatever it is to yeah. push this one so it's like this mm -hmm. instead of like this yeah okay um and then you measure this one to be like hey it's a little bit off mm -hmm. how do you know that this one hasn't moved because, because when if you, you have send to put a photon, energy to it, it, it because the photon would bounce off immediately and then the, it, the action happens afterwards because of momentum. In the same way, if I touch this here really quickly, most of the movement happens after the slap. In fact, it kind of has to. Right. And it's the same with these. Like, at the time of measurements, it's good. So this is a useful photon, the first one of it's bouncing oh, off. But, then but you've anything moved after, it now. but then you've moved it, it's kind of useless. So you only have one opportunity to measure it, even yes. if it has moved, even if it's indifference to the other Correct. one. And then the reason why <laughs> having... It's like a really inefficient system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, it gets much more, like, tricky in that sense, because these two um, electrons, they exist in the normal world. And right. in the normal world, heat is electromagnetic energy. Right, yep. So yep. that heat, e even the ambient heat in the table, is enough to make the electron become decoherent in its spin. Like, because there's heat coming this way, there's heat coming that way, 
there's microwaves, there's, there's tons radio of waves, there's all yeah, that in waves. a regular so, home, for example, yeah. yeah. So in a quantum computer, you have to you have to totally isolate it. How would you? You have to create a Faraday cage around it. That's that stops oh, all cage? The Faraday cage, and that's a kind of a basically a metal grid or a metal kind of box around it and that stops all radio waves and oh, wow. uh, all the electromagnetic interference so they usually put it in a huge electromagnetically shielded room and they put container 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 and each container is also progressively colder till they get to like plus 0 0.002 um, kelvin or almost absolute zero right because most of like in the way we can currently manipulate atoms we can only really do it when they're super cold. That's we, yeah. <laughs> and there's there's ways of trying to overcome all of that, but it's it'll require a lot of scientific kind right. of Right. So you can't go on Amazon everything. right now and just order a quantum computer for your house. Yeah. We're not quite there. <laughs> <laughs>